Thank you so much for coming this evening and sharing your Sunday evening with us. Um, it, it's great to have everyone here today, um, and it really means so much uh, to to us that you're you're making the time for this film. Um, this this group of people, this group of doctors, is an amazing community of folks um, and therapists and physical therapists. All the physicians and and medical experts who uh, do this work are really incredible folks. And we're honored to have a few of them here with us tonight, especially uh, Dr. David Clark and Dr. David Schechter. Um, thank you both for coming. Um, we are starting a grassroots screen screening campaign. This is the first one, the digital premiere, but we'll be doing them throughout the year uh, for groups big and small. And if you're interested in hosting one, we'd love for you to reach out to us at TMH Film at gmail.com, or you can go to our website and fill out a form there. Yes, I wanted to second that. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, it's been incredible to watch all the chats and all the comments and all the interaction that's been happening. Um, we, Marion and I both feel honored to be a part of this community. Um, and seeing us all together in this one space has been pretty incredible. If you would like to make a donation to the film, it would mean a lot to us if you could take a moment to do that at some point. This film is like an independent production that Marion and I um, have taken on and we really could use your help and support um, in getting it seen by as many people as possible. And 100% of the donations are just going to do outreach and more screenings. Events like this aren't cheap to do. And so really your support would mean a lot. Um, I'm going to turn over to Ava, who's going to lead our uh, Q&A. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be back with you. Um, I was able to watch some of, I've seen the documentary, but I was um, watching along with you as we were preparing for the question and answers. And I just want to thank you for such an incredible amount of thoughtful questions and for so much engagement. Um, I'm also a chronic pain sufferer. And so feeling so many people coming together who are curious about this or skeptical but willing or have um, experienced healing. It's really um, been a very moving evening. So I'm, um, I'm so psyched. I'm just so, this is such a wonderful night. So my job right now is to get to do everybody's formal in introductions. Um, I get to brag about everybody a little bit. So I'm one at a time just going to introduce each of our panelists, some who you've met, but um, I'm sure their credits will blow you away. So here we go. We are joined this evening, as you've heard whispers through the digital hallways, by the man himself, uh, Dr. Howard Schubner is joining us. Um, he was the doctor you saw featured in this film tonight. He's been treating chronic pain patients for nearly two decades, and he's recognized as a leading researcher in the field. No big deal. Uh, he's currently working with United Health Insurance Company on a pilot program using the methods depicted in the film. And a lot of his time right now is devoted to teaching doctors and other healthcare professionals, healthcare professionals about the intricacies of this work. We are also joined by Dr. David Hanscom, who is a complex spinal surgeon who's been based in Seattle for 32 years. He, drum roll please, recently quit his surgical practice to focus on teaching people how to break loose from the grip of chronic mental and physical pain with and without surgery. His most recent effort is the DOC Journey, that's D-O-C Journey, an online healing resource, um, which we'll be, we will be sharing via email um, a couple of days after this. Uh, we, there will also be links in, in chat for anything that we have available right now. And Dr. Hanscom will be co-leading a three-day virtual training called the Pain Summit, which is next weekend at the Open Center, and we will also send you information about that. Next up, we have director Kent Bassett, who you've met. You may not know that he is an Emmy-nominated editor and filmmaker from Arizona. He's edited a number of feature documentaries that have premiered at, listen for it, South by Southwest, Tribeca Film Festival. And this is so incredible to me how personal this film is. A lot of the drive to make This Might Hurt comes from Kent's own struggle with chronic pain when he was 22, which I think he's going to share um, a little bit about that with us. 
We are also joined by director Marianne Cunningham, uh, who you just met. She is an Emmy-winning filmmaker who has produced series for a number of networks, including a few you might have heard of, like Netflix, National Geographic, A&E. Um, she joined fellow Chapman University alum, Kent, after they met in New York City, and they embarked on directing the film together in their spare time, which took them over five years. So as Kent was saying, this really is a labor of love. So I'm going to pivot over, now that you know about this amazing panel, to our questions. Um, I have a couple questions that I just want to ask to get us started, and then we're going to start asking the questions um, that we received in chat. We will do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, there's quite a long list, so we'll go as quickly as possible. So coming over to Dr. Schubner first, if you could give us the succinct, maybe one minute version <laughs> of how you started doing this work. Yes, uh, thanks so much, um, Ava. And just wanna say, Kent Marion, you did an amazing job. Uh, Kent, you didn't mention that you had to sell your baseball cards to, uh, to finance the film. I was looking forward to the red carpet, but... Uh, I guess we'll just uh, go virtually. Uh, what was the question, Eva? Oh, how did I get started in this work? Uh, you know, uh, in 2002, a good friend of mine said, you know, you should read this book by Dr. Sarno. I know people were talking about him in the chat box as the movie was showing, and I read uh, one of his books, and I was just intrigued. And I went to, I called him up, I went to study with him for a little bit, and I came home back to my hospital in Detroit. And I said, I want to start a clinic and I want to start seeing people. And I just talk to people and I spend time with people and I talk to them about their lives and their pain. And over the last 18 years, I've just learned so much. And we've learned so much even since the film was made about how to understand chronic pain, how to treat it and how, and how all these other conditions are often linked with it. And uh, it's just a, a radical statement you know, as you see some of the doctors in the movie, it's a radical statement to say that the vast majority of people with chronic pain do not have a structural problem in their body to account for the pain. It's a radical statement. And that's, you know, something that makes me kind of happy to say for my 60s, 70s self of, you know, an old time radical. But it's just the truth. And we've got data now that we didn't have uh, when the film was started about the efficacies of these treatments and about the... Um, and about the percentage of people uh, who don't have structural problems, as I said. So uh, anyway, I better stop. But uh, it's been an incredible journey, and I've learned everything from the people, the patients who taught me everything that I've learned along the way. Next question. We're going to send the same one over to Dr. Hanscom. Could you give us the one-ish minute version of how you came to do this work? Thank you. I can do it actually in 30 seconds. I had chronic pain myself for 15 years. I came out of it, fortunately, in 2003. I didn't know how it started. I did not how I know how I came out of it. But I've been on this 30-year quest to figure it out. And probably this last 12 months, the answers have really fallen into place. A big part of my journey was in 2009, I had Dr. Schumer be my keynote speaker at a course I put on called A Course on Compassion, Empathy in the Face of Chronic Pain. It was at that conference, all of a sudden I realized that my 17 symptoms made sense. So the whole thing came together in a big, it's just hard to describe that minute. And so from that point on, um, I've learned a lot from different sources, including ongoing work with Dr. Schumner, his research, different people. But we've watched hundreds of patients go to pain-free. And watching patients go to pain-free has been by far and away the most rewarding phase of my career. It's been unbelievable. Uh, Kent, we're coming over to you. Would you share with us um, a little bit more about what made you want to make this documentary? Yeah, so I um, I came to this because of my own experience with chronic pain. Uh, when I was 22 years old, I had debilitating pain in my arms that I thought was from lifting weights. And it just got worse and worse. I saw so many doctors and um, it wasn't until I read a book by Dr. John Sarno, The Mind-Body Prescription. I read it at Barnes & Noble. I knew for sure, oh my God, this is what's going on. And I got better the next day. Then the pain moved around my body. I had then chest pain and shoulder pain. And it was just a real education in 
uh, what Sarno calls the symptom imperative, where I didn't have a name for it. I was just kind of flabbergasted that my mind could just move pain around my body like that. Um, but ever since then, I wanted to tell a story about this. And it took a decade before I sort of came up with this idea um, to try to make a documentary about it. Um, and But that's that was my motivation, um, was this personal struggle I had. Um Marianne, we're coming over to you. And would you share a little bit about um, what made you want to make this movie and what brought you to the mind-body world? Yeah, definitely. I was introduced to Kent. Um, he had started making the film. Um, he had done a lot of the initial photography, but uh, he had sort of uh, been a little, a little bit stuck. Um, and so we were introduced by a mutual friend um, because I had always wanted to do a documentary uh, produce and direct one. So um, the friend knew that I might be able to help. So Kent and I started working together. Uh, the first time I watched the footage or the trailer, I was a little, I was in disbelief. And I actually said to Kent, like, do you believe this? Mm -hmm. But um, he said, <clears throat> yes, and he told me his story of, uh, of going through chronic pain. Uh, and I started digging into the footage. I started watching the stories. I spent hours and hours um, in these in these people's lives. Uh, and I was really <clears throat> drawn to the way that the mind can control the body and the way that this all works. And um, I, I started seeing it in my life, times that I had been in pain before and uh, had been experiencing symptoms um, that directly related to, to stress in my life. So it was very easy for me to not only, you know, fall in love with um, the topic, but also the stories that we are telling. Um, so I just stuck around and many years later, we are finally finished. What I'd love to do now is start um, taking some questions. We've been gathering them from chat and we've got some, some great ones. So the first one is from Jennifer and she's shared with us that she's a therapist and she has a client with chronic pain. Um, many are similar to some of the subjects she was seeing in the documentary. And she's wondering, um, is there an online resource or a class available? Um, Dr. Schubner, would you be able to speak a little bit to this? Sure, no problem. Um, there's, we as um, I think, uh, well, Ava and Marion was were talking about. We have a community of of physicians and therapists, and coaches and physical therapists, a variety of people who are doing this work together. Uh, so, for example, uh, you mentioned David Clark. So we have something called the PPD Association, Psychophysiologic Disorders Association, and that uh, Ken will put that up for you. Uh, it's an online resource to find uh, physicians and therapists who do this work. Uh, there are several uh, resources that we'll put up, including um, David mentioned the doc journey that he started. Uh, I have a program. I have two programs, one at unlearnyourpain.com, one, one at freedomfromchronicpain.com, the Curable app. We've worked with those folks. It was an amazing uh, project. Uh, we work with um, uh, Alan Gordon, our, our great colleague in the Pain uh, Psychology Center in Los Angeles. So. Uh, if you just begin to, you know, search online and the, the courses we're teaching, et cetera. So if you just begin to search online for uh, mind-body syndrome, <clears throat> for uh, TMS, tension myositis syndrome, the tmswiki.org uh, is another uh, fantastic uh, resource. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And then there's a whole sorts of books. There must be a dozen books that have now been written uh, by, well, David and I have written some, but... Also, my colleague Alan Abbas and I wrote a book together. So, anyway, I, I don't know, I don't know what to say, but it's not just one, but there's a lot, and uh, you should you should just kind of poke around. You'll find it. People find us all the time. This next question is a, a really important one, and um, I'm going to send it back over to you, Dr. Schubner. Uh, the question, both from Chris and Amala. Um, and some other people might have <laughs> asked it as well. Um, is this work reaching communities of color? Yeah, um, we've, we've realized, uh, I think if you look closely at the relationship between emotions and pain, there's a strong, strong relationship as we pointed out in the film. This is part of the human condition. But we've also seen this tremendous amount of data on the effect of racial injustice on people. For example, the weathering effect, how health of people of color is affected 
by racial injustice. And it turns out racial injustice also is like is one of the factors that can cause chronic pain. Uh, I'm starting to work with some folks here in Detroit and um, and uh, nationally to uh, do some work on this and to write some papers and kind of bring this to light uh, because it's a uh, it's a crucial and uh, important topic. Dr. Hanscom, we have a question. Um, I think this could go to either of the doctors, but it is. Um, specifically around spinal surgery. So Matt um, gave us a great question and he's asking, it's a big one, but he's asking, how do systems change? And he says, especially systems that are built on a capitalist model of healthcare. And the, he gives the example that the evidence for spinal surgery is poor, despite that the system pushes evidence-based um, medicine. So he feels that there's a, a big gap being set up, but that very few people know how to address and how to uh, bridge that gap. So maybe from a perspective of a spinal surgeon, do you agree with that premise? And what is the way forward in terms of changing the system? So the change is going to have to come from the public. The hospital systems, instrumentation companies, pharmacy are making too much money. It turns out that really most symptoms are created by an interaction between your circumstances and your coping skills. And when your stress limits are exceeded, you get sick, you develop symptoms. So by learning how to increase your resiliency and process stress better, people heal. Spine surgery doesn't do that. In fact, this, the success rate of a spine fusion for back pain is 20%, 20%. That's why I finally quit my practice because when you have a failed spine surgery, in fact, the chance of failure is between 40 to 60%. There's actually double the chance of failure operating in the presence of chronic pain than there is success. So the change has to come from the patients and the entire system could be flipped on his ear really quickly by tripling or quadrupling the reimbursement spent talking to the patients. We don't know what's going on. We're making major, major, major surgical decisions, 14 hours of surgery on one visit. The complication rate is 75%. I'm in charge of the Scoliosis Research Society Non-Operative Care Committee. There are no standards of care that are defined, none. Nothing is defined yet. It's $20 billion a year in climbing. I looked last week, there's over 1.2 million surgeries done a year on just the spine. And the vast majority of those simply should not be done. This question comes from Etir. And forgive me if that's a mispronunciation um, of your name, but thank you for the question. And here it is. What have you observed as the factors that determine a patient's success with healing versus those that don't? And I guess also included in this, is there a pattern that you've seen in that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, to start with, um, when we see people who are open-minded, who begin to, con who can see the relationships in their lives, like you saw in the movie, uh, who can understand that it's hard to, it's hard to understand that your brain could be causing pain. It's a really hard thing because there's so much fear related to pain. As Alan uh, Gordon, my friend always says, we're evolutionary wired to be afraid of pain because it's a danger signal. We need it. It's protecting us, but the message that our brain is giving us may not be that we're injured. It may be there's something wrong in our life. So being able to kind of wrap your head around that seems to be a critically important part of our uh, treatment. The second thing is getting an accurate diagnosis. So many times people have been told by doctor after doctor after doctor or physical therapist or other folks that they're damaged, that they won't heal, that they can't get better that they're going to just have to live with it. And those words just stick in their mind. And that can be uh, a huge barrier. Uh, some people have tremendous amounts of trauma in their life, going back to childhood. Uh, and people with complex PTSD often need more emotional processing work. And sometimes that's not always easily available. There's lots of different ways of doing that. I saw a lot of stuff in the chat about different types of therapies. And we don't say that we have the one and only one that works for everybody. Um, but you saw with Tony, whereas Tony continued to get hits in his life, more people died in his life, people kept dying on him. And uh, 
the situations that he had to deal with were just really, really hard on somebody so young and so sweet and so fragile. Uh, and so those are some of the things that I found that uh, seem to be critical components of recovery. Let's send that same question over to Dr. Hanscom. Have you observed similar factors or differing factors in something that would indicate a key to success um, healing with this work? Yeah, my approach is a little different. So I'm 100% supportive of Dr. Schumner and the pain circuits and the pain triggers, et cetera. So emotional pain and physical pain are processed in the same way. But we've also found out when, that you are under sustained threat, whether it's physical or mental, that your body's immune system kicks up and there's inflammation. So I think she'll be available through the through the notes, but I put together, a group of us put together what's called Plan A, call, it's called Lowering Inflammation Lengthens Life. And there's 12 categories of things you can do to lower inflammatory markers. And as your inflammation lowers, your body's chemical profile changes and you just feel better. Emotional factors are part of it. There's also, also things like an anti-inflammatory diet, exercise, better sleep. There's anger processing, forgiveness. There's also anxiety processing. There's play. When you're at play, not obsessive play to distract yourself, but play just to truly relax and change your body's chemical makeup. So again, you've changed the brain circuitry. You've changed the body's chemical response. And I look at the body as a total bodily response to the environment or your circumstances. And as you learn these tools to regulate that, then you're safe. Once you have control of your body's chemistry or reactions, and again, I think Dr. Schumer in, the, in this film showed really clearly that you have choices. You can make some choices. And those choices have a profound effect on your body's chemistry. Um, related to what you're, what you're both speaking about, um, we're, we've had a couple of questions around this, and I'm going to try to combine them to see if we can answer them at the same time. But um, both from David and Scott, they're asking about well, David is noticing that in the documentary, there's a focus on um, anger and guilt. And he's curious if that's intentional or that's just what comes up and is wondering about focusing on fear or ambivalence or confusion or sadness um, and if those help create release in the same way. Mm -hmm. And then related to that, if it's not too much to take on in one question is, a curiosity from Scott around, do you need to know the reason for their repressed emotion that's causing the pain in order for there to be that release? Yeah, great questions. Uh, so to, to, to put it into perspective and make it very simple, that we start with an assessment, an evaluation, making sure we have the diagnosis right of a mind-body condition. Then we do pain, neuroscience education to make sure people understand. Then we help to calm their nervous system with meditation, with somatic tracking or mindful awareness type of exercises to help them go to safety. And you, didn't, you just didn't see a lot of that in the film. But remember what Kim said, I'm not afraid of it anymore, where she was pruning the, the hedges. Uh, so a big, part of, a big part of our treatment is that before we even get to the emotional processing work. Not everyone needs emotional processing work in order to recover. Um, and certainly not everyone's going to know, you know, is there a certain key like, oh, this is the one thing, the one emotional thing that really did it. And I don't have to worry about the other stuff. Uh, it all comes together. And so we try to individualize the treatment and make sure everybody gets what they need. Not everyone needs emotional processing. And when you do emotional processing work, for some people, it focuses a lot on anger and guilt, but other people, it's more related to fear or more related to grief. Uh, and as David pointed out, we're always, the point of doing emotional, emotional processing is not just to recognize emotions or just to feel them, but to be able to move through them and move to compassion for self, compassion for others, as David pointed out, forgiveness. Uh, and then taking action in your life that might be necessary uh, to help you do what's important to you so you don't feel trapped in your life. Uh, so it's, it's very nuanced and it's just hard for the film to show all of, all of that. Great, thank you. And um, related to that, um, do you, have you found about, 
noticed anything about the efficiency of peer work rather than therapist participant work. Um, we're getting that question from Barb. Yeah, there's uh, so many ways to do this work. Um, people have started doing coaching work. Uh, people are, you know, doing a lot of obviously nowadays virtual work. I'm doing all, all work virtually. So I'm not running groups right now that we used to. Uh, some people do fantastic with groups. Other people prefer uh, individual treatment. Uh, it's 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 a continuum, and you can uh, you know whatever seems to work within your setting. I found groups to be very difficult to 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 monitor and do after a long time. Uh, so I started doing less of them actually than I than I used to uh, a few years ago. But a lot of my colleagues do 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 group work, and it can be uh, incredibly powerful. So Ava can make a comment here, please. Okay, a couple of things. Um, I won't go into anger too much. I guess it's interesting listening to Howard talk because as I listen to him, what we're doing is almost identical. We have different words for the same thing. So it's hard to explain all this in this type of format, but please look at anger. It's always the tipping point of health versus, I call it the shortcut to health is forgiveness. Bam, it calms down your nervous system, you move forward. It's huge, but you can't just get there. It's a learned skill that you have to learn. So anger is big. I have a little different approach. I agree with Howard's emotional processing completely, but I go through this process myself and you don't have to understand the triggers. Just say, I'm triggered. You can use the tools. If you spend a lot of time digging for the results. It tends to be a little bit counterproductive at times. Part of our doc journey is twice a week. We have a Q&A for an hour at noon. It has been incredible. We, I've never seen people get better more quickly in the group setting. It turns out the data shows that the virtual workshops are almost or maybe even the same effectiveness as the in-person workshops. We've also found that the group settings probably secrete, cause oxytocin to be secreted, which is a very anti-inflammatory medication, social bonding. And Howard would agree with this, that loneliness is a major factor in creating chronic pain. So we have found the group settings to be really, really critical. So we we love it. I I, I run the groups twice a week and I just had the best time. Great. And um, while we're while we're with you, um, you might ha uh, either of you can weigh in, but I wonder if Dr. Hanscom has uh, back experience with this. Can this technique work for nerve damage and nerve regeneration? Um, this question is from Karen. Dr. Hanscom, you want to chime in on that? Well, we know that it works for phantom limb pain. There's we've seen cases of that. And I think Howard's also seen, seen the same thing because talk about nerve damage, the nerves hurt, there's neuromas and there's nothing there. But I'm convinced now that you can reprogram your brain around almost anything. I had one gentleman, gentleman who had 27 surgeries in 20 years. He's been pain-free now for five years. So I think what happens with the programming, you develop this new nervous system within the old nervous system and the new nervous system doesn't have pain. So the answer is, I don't know. I can't, I don't, on a given person, I never know, but I've seen the most incredible circumstances heal that I just never would have believed 10 years ago could have been possible. We have so many questions coming in. I think we're going to do another five or 10 minutes of questions. So let's do one more right now. Um, okay. So this is from Kartik um, to Dr. Schubner, especially in the case of trauma, what have you done to enable a safe environment for participants to help each other express difficult emotions? Uh, safety is everything, um, and and compassion really. To me, it's it's completely around compassion because uh, if you're not able to create a an environment where the person that you're with knows that they're cared about, basically they're loved. Uh, and that whatever they say, whatever happens is safe with you is, and they will be okay with it. So it takes a little bit of courage to create that environment to say, I'm here and we will be able to handle whatever comes up. Um, and I learned a lot of that from Dr. Alan Abbas, one of my mentors. Um, so it's something that you do with experience and it's something that good therapists do and uh, you have to be very careful because some people are 
uh, have been traumatized, clearly. And uh, you just have to go little by little, step by step, making sure you're checking along the way, making sure people feel safe. So I'm going to do a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to take a few more questions, and then we will say goodnight. So the first one, announcement, you are here. We are so grateful that you're here. And as Kent and Marion shared, um, the way that this film gets out, the way that this information gets out is through you. You are now the community around this film. So if you're curious about what you saw, if you liked what you saw, if you know somebody that would be interested in it, can you picture that person or a couple of people in your mind and share this information with them? Um, you can... People can buy a personal copy of the film from the website, which is thismighthurtfilm.com. The other thing you can do is host a screening. So maybe you have a clinical group you work with. Maybe you want to do a really um, new bachelorette party. I don't know, whatever you're into. <laughs> if you have a group that would like to watch this movie, um, please sign up to host a screening. We're going to put a link in chat where you can do that. But you can also um, go to the website. Again, that's thismighthurtfilm.com. And I just really, I want to get to all the good questions, but I am just compelled to say I am not a random person just telling you to tell your friends. Like I, from personal experience, watching this has changed my life. And it's because I happen to know the person that made the movie. So you might be that person in somebody's life that this information could really change something for them. So please send the email, please direct people to the website. Not only does it help the movie, but it really does help people who are in pain. So get, help us get the word out. The last thing is we can use your financial support. If you are in a position to make a donation, um, maybe you didn't pay to come to the screening and you could donate the price of what a movie ticket would be. Maybe you um, just have some extra bones lying around. We would appreciate any and all of it. And as a reminder, um, just what Kent and Marion said, that all proceeds go towards creating more screenings and, and getting the, the word out. So it, it all goes directly to that. So whatever you're capable of giving would be so appreciated by the creative team and the doctors who are in the field doing this work. So Thank you for listening. Thank you all so thank much. You Sorry. Um, thank you all so much for the donations that have come in already. Uh, we're seeing them. We appreciate them so much. They are so helpful. And they're going to help us with this grassroots screening campaign to get the film to more people throughout the year. So thank you. It's happening live, folks. She's popping in to tell us it's happening live. It's so exciting, right? There's real downsides to virtual screenings. And then there's real upsides because you can just be with so many more people from all over and you can watch those donations come in live. Um, so we're going to do another about five minutes of questions. If you have to jump out, we get it. We hope you have a great night. Um, but if you can stick around, we're going to get through as many of your questions um, as we can in the next five or 10 minutes. Ava, did you announce the pain summit by chance? Um, do it right now. It's Do it, please. I think it's on the notes, but this has been put together in conjunction with a pain summit we're holding next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's a virtual pain summit. It's intended for everybody, mostly medical professionals, social workers, physical therapists, OTs, physicians, but it's also well within the reach of people that are in pain. It's not, we're excited about it because what we're doing is we're starting to collect the basic science research. And again, Howard's been a major factor in this. And it's a collective effort to try to get a punctuation point to, to create this new awareness in chronic pain. It is solvable. The neuroscience is deep. There's actually much more data for this than what I would say traditional medicine right now. So it's, it's easy access. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. A great set of national speakers. Dr. Schumer is one of those speakers also. Dr. Stephen Porges also. So we're excited about the Pain Summit. It's our first annual Pain Summit. So please consider joining us for that. Well, I'm glad you did it. Could not have said it better. Um, okay, coming over to you, Dr. Schubner. This is a, a great question that a lot of people have from Alyssa. She's asking, what is recommended for maintenance what, once patients start to feel a lot better, but they want to avoid relapse? Yeah, a lot of people uh, ask that. 
I think the most important thing is to not be afraid of having pain come back, not be afraid of getting pain or getting anxious or having trouble sleeping sometimes because this is a human condition. Everyone suffers from being human. And oftentimes I say to patients, oh, I see what your problem is. You're human. You have a brain. You have a body. Stress is going to happen in life. You can't change that. And I still get pain sometimes. In the last five years, I've had a couple of different pains that have lingered for a while. So if we're afraid of having pain, if we're afraid that it's going to come back and we're always looking over our shoulders, that's the problem. So the best thing to do is live your life, live with joy, live with love, um, and do whatever it takes to stay healthy and balanced. And so if you find writing is helpful, do some writing. If you find meditation is helpful, do meditation. But don't, don't feel like you have to do homework, that you have to uh, be careful living every day, worrying uh, that uh, you're going to have a mind-body reaction because uh, we all do. We are getting life lessons here tonight from Dr. Schubner himself. Um, I'm really going to take that one to heart. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Shelly, and let's send this back over to Dr. Schubner. She's asking, are there clients who would turn away, um, asking if their pain could not be helped with these methods? Is that something you would be able to identify? Well, uh, the work that I do is mind-body medicine work. It's, it's I treat people with brain-based pain. And so you can help people cope with pain better if they have a purely structural problem causing it, such as metastatic cancer. Uh, you know, I've talked to people in palliative care about these kinds of methods. You can, you can help people with that. But if someone has uh, that kind of uh, very serious pain condition, uh, we're not going to probably make that just go away. And, and people differ on, on how powerful the brain is. David and I differ on this a bit, I think, for sure. Um, but I'm always willing to help people and use these methods. Uh, it's just that when the diagnosis is a purely non-structural problem, like all the people in the film that you saw, I can be very confident and hopeful that they can actually eliminate pain as opposed to uh, simply coping with it better. So, uh, Ava, yes, you want to respond to that? Please do. Yeah, I think there's something about Kent and Marion, by the way. So I met Kent maybe five years ago in New York, and I, he's been remarkable. And I think there are things in this life that deserve to be supported. And I rarely see somebody who takes – a lot of people get better from chronic pain. I mean, we see this all the time. This is not unusual. But we don't see that many people that committed to go out and spend five to seven years of their life trying to get the message out to other people. This is an admirable, admirable effort. We find out one of the end runs to solve chronic pain is the spiritual journey, play, but also giving back. So they're giving back in a huge way. So for those of you who have found relief from chronic pain, and I know there's many of you on this film tonight, please consider supporting them strongly. They deserve it. They're incredible people. This also, I was touched by the film personally because it, it's life. It reflects my patient's experience. Not everybody gets better. Some people just have so much they don't seem to get through things. But I will say, as far as people getting better, I never know. I have a, over 100 patients with surgical severe pinched nerves that the pain disappeared. I was shocked. I actually essentially put myself out of business. It's a noble effort. Please support it strongly. This word needs to get out, and I think this film will help a lot of people. Let's close out with one last question, um, and we're going to send it over to Dr. Schubner to close us out. Um, here's the question. With all this new data coming out, do we have any sense of when there will be a movement in medical schools to start teaching this work? Yes, I'm glad you asked that, but the answer is I don't know. It will happen. You cannot keep a good idea down forever. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we are working so hard to get the research done. We're actively doing research to show the efficacy of this work. And the results have been incredibly positive. As you'll see in the next few years, more and more data will come out. So that will help. We're doing more and more trainings and teachings. And you can find all about that at my website, unlearnyourpain.com, and the 
uh, David's website and the ppdassociation.org. Um, but every day I get emails from people, professionals and non-professionals from all around the country, from all around the world asking about this. And it's a question of when the tipping point will occur. What David said earlier was wise, that patients are the ones who will drive this because they have, you know, they're the ones who are suffering. They're the ones who have this great need. But professionals have this great need too, because professionals know that the efficacy of our treatments to date has been poor for these complex conditions. And it's not that hard. We can make a huge dent. We can make a huge difference. And you can help us, as David uh, pointed out, by supporting the film, by spreading the message, by telling your friends and neighbors, et cetera, about this so that more people can begin to understand that the power of the mind and that people don't have to suffer as much as they have uh, with chronic pain. Great. Well, that concludes our question and answer. I'm just going to hand the mic over to Kent and Marianne to close us out. Thank you, Ava. And thank you, Dr. Schubner, Dr. Hanscom for joining us um, and answering these questions. And thank you to everyone submitting the questions. I also want to thank Connor, Paula, Shuchi, and Ava, our team tonight who made this event happen. We're so appreciative of you guys and you did such great work. We really appreciate it. Uh, I also want to thank Lisa, Jonah, and Monica, uh, the team who are helping us with our grassroots screening campaign throughout this year. Uh, they're going to be emailing a bunch of you, uh, asking if you want to host screenings. So Lisa, Jonah, and Monica, thank you so much in advance for all the hard work you're doing. Um, Kent, anything else? I think that's everything. Um, I'm just so thrilled still to be here. We're seeing donations rolling in still, and it's just really making it feel like so special to be in this community. I think it's a really amazing community and I'm, I'm proud to be part of it. So thanks for joining us.